session following up our previous report on the role of the magistracy. Welcome to our, our witnesses. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the process, we have to start off by members making a declaration of their interests. Uh, I'm a non-practicing barrister and consultant to a law firm. I'm a non-practicing barrister. No? Don't use anything else? No? That's it? No? We're all okay. That's fine. Right. Well, I wonder if then we can ask our panel just to introduce yourselves um, who you are and the role that you play within the magistracy, which we're aware of, but those watching may not. Um, my name is Jo King. I'm a magistrate. I sit in a Sussex Central Bench, and I have um, the role of the magistrate's reform lead at the moment. Right. My name is Duncan Baxter. I'm the new national lead magistrate. I've been a magistrate for 20-something years, yeah. and I sit in North Yorkshire. Right. And I'm John Bache, I'm Chairman of the Magistrate Association, um, I'm from Cheshire and I've been a magistrate since 1989. Well thank you very much all of you. Well, You're all experienced magistrates uh, as we know and some of you I know uh, helped us um, directly or indirectly with the evidence to our previous uh, inquiry. Uh, one of the things that struck us uh, in that earlier um, inquiry was the evidence we had about the uh, concern about low morale uh, amongst magistrates and, and a number of reasons were posited. Uh, why that was the case, as, we, as we'll all remember, and I know it's been discussed since. Um, what's your view on the current state uh, of morale amongst the magistracy, now that we've moved on a bit of time from perhaps, that report? Perhaps, Mr Chair, I could start. Yes, do, Joe. Yeah. Um, there was a survey of magistrates done uh, at the end of last year, um, which uh, was designed partly to um, understand better the issues around morale, um, and certainly um, there was a mixed picture, I think it's fair to say. Um, magistrates reported very high satisfaction with certain aspects yeah. of the role, particularly giving back to the community and um, the work that they do in court. But they also expressed frustrations with certain parts of the process, so um, delays in courts, inefficiencies in court hearings, frustrations with um, CPS disclosure issues mm -hmm. and the such likes. I think um, it, it, certainly at the moment we, that picture is maintained and there are uh, high degrees of satisfaction with some areas but still the same frustrations with other parts of the role. Um, we also of course uh, are in an environment where there's a lot of change yes. and that's causing some disquiet for magistrates because uh, change is a difficult process to bring people through um, and that's uh, certainly true of the reform programme. There was a suggestion that part of that change problem was because change appeared to be done to magistrates um, rather than with them, uh, and that, that it was a rather top-down process and they weren't much involved. Has that changed? And there was a um, series of documents, jurisdictional documents, produced by the senior judiciary with regard to reform earlier this year. They were the judicial ways of working documents. Um, they were sent out to all judiciary and um, everybody was invited to read them and respond to those that were relevant to their particular areas of work. Um, in addition, um, the, there were 38, I think, uh, visits around England and Wales where um, senior, excuse me, senior judiciary, um, and I took part in those that magistrates were So we're were talking present. about presiding judges? Um, or they, no, there were, well, there were some uh, where the deputy senior presiding judge yeah. attended and other um, leadership judges attended to talk about reform and to gather views. And um, the combination of the responses to those visits and the survey um, meant that views were uh, received from either individuals or bodies representing 10,000 judicial office holders um, on reform. So there is certainly consultation taking place. Um, we are, of course, dealing with reform, which is an iterative process, uh, to use HMTTS's words, which means that um, it, it, it's quite difficult to articulate what the end state will be because it's a um, program which is being developed and built upon as each level is tested, then the next level is, so is do developed. Do you actually know where you're going? Um, I, I think there are certainly um, a framework where we know that um, HMCTS has certainly set out uh, where they expect us to be in terms of digitalisation, um, increased use of video and, and so yeah. on in the courts. Um, what the impact will be for magistrates I think is slightly more difficult to anticipate at this point. So it's unclear. Um, and so that, of course, leads to uncertainty, and uncertainty yeah, yeah. leads to issues of morale. Yeah, I understand that entirely. And, and you mentioned, yeah, Mr. West, do you want I, to come in? I think uh, um, one of the indicators of uh, low morale was the high resignation yes. rate mm. of the yes, magistracy for that. a while. Um, yeah. 
I think in one year, quite a significant number yeah. of magistrates resigned. Uh, I think a lot of that was to do with the introduction of um, technology into the courtroom that they either weren't up to speed with at that time. I think in some areas, in fact nationally, I think the training for magistrates in the new technology left something to be desired and therefore their, their confidence in the technology perhaps wasn't as high as it should be. I think all those things have now been overcome and therefore we haven't got that high resignation rate now. And if you take resignation rates as an indicator of, of, of morale, I think it's probably on the up. Okay. But Ms King talked about the visits done by the, the judiciary. What about the engagement by officials of HMCTS? Because sometimes the people are actually have the ability to make your life more or less comfortable on a on a day to day basis. There's um, a group called the Magistrates Engagement Group, which is jo uh, <coughs> jointly chaired by Joe and a district judge. Yes. And that's where HMCTS presents to okay. us their ideas on reforms and listens to our comments. And I think that is appreciated because the magistrates feel that via that group they are having some input into the reform. Uh, and there's, there's groups for different areas, so there's family, magistrates and the yes. high courts as well. Yes. So they are, in, they are involving the, the users of the code phase. There are also um, magistrates on, I think, virtually all, if not all, of the individual programme um, mm -hmm. working groups involved with specific projects to do with reform. But do you get a sense, okay, you're involved, do you sense that, that your concerns get actually taken on board and acted on, as opposed to being politely listened to? I would say we're very, very well supported by the senior judiciary. And what um, about the HMCTS? Well, the, of course, the nature of reform and the nature of our role means that it's not really for us to negotiate directly with HMCTS. So we have to um, respect the constitutional divide between ourselves, and so our concerns are being fed through the judicial engagement groups, of which the magistrate engagement group is one, um, through to the senior judiciary, who will be um, having that dialogue with HMCTS. And I know there are a number of um, key areas that all judicial holders are very um, mm. concerned that we do uphold, such as open justice and access to justice. So, Mr. Bash, do you think the, mem the members of morale is better now or not? I think it is improving for a number of reasons. Yes, I do. I mean, the, the big thing that affects morale is obviously core closures, and core closures yes. are ultimately decided by HMCTS. Yes. There's got to be a balance between efficiency and, and justice, and where that balance lies is, is the difficult question. Uh, but core closures have a big effect on the morale of individual magistrates, and a lot of magistrates feel that local justice has effectively disappeared, which is a, a big shame and does affect morale, obviously, yes. because you want to support your local community and work for your local community. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, if it's a more efficient system at the end of it, then that can be justified to, to a certain extent. Okay. It's a question of balance, really. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, one thing I was going to ask about, Mr Webster, you could probably help me on this. There have been changes, of course, to the leadership structure. In fact, mm. you, you sort of sonify that, in a sense, uh, because you, you've moved away from the bench, <coughs> National Bench uh, Chairs Forum. Um, which of course was an elected body to an appointed role, uh, mm. which is yourself uh, as the, uh, the magistrate with the magistrate's leadership executive now. Um, right. Can you just give me a sense as to, to how that works in practice um, and what your relationship is, for example, with Mr. Bache and his association uh, and with the rest of the magistracy now and indeed with um, uh, the Ministry of Justice and HMCTS? Yes. What, what, what additionalities does the new structure bring, do you think? Well, I have a very positive view of those changes that were introduced on the uh, 1st of October. Yeah. Um, firstly, they, they do align the leadership structures yeah. uh, of the magistracy with the rest of the yeah. judiciary. Um, and I think the process does have the support of the magistracy. Um, for example, for the, my position of national leadership uh, magistrate, there were a, number of, uh, a good number of applicants uh, and the post of the regional leaderships, there were some strong applicants right. as well. So I think the magistracy is engaged with the process. Okay. People put themselves forward for those roles. Um, and the terms of reference for the magistrate's leadership executive uh, gives a very strong mandate to those officers to engage with the local magistracy, to have strategic and build good relationships with the senior judiciary. Um, and we act through a magistrate's liaison group, yeah. of which the uh, Magistrates Association, the Chief Magistrate's Office, 
are involved in that, together with HMCTS officials. Right. So that's where it all comes together formally, mm -hmm. but informally, um, I think there's a very good working re relationship between the MLE, the Magistrates Association, and the Chief Magistrate's Office. Okay. What, what's your take on it, Mr. Bates, from me? Well, I'd agree with that. The, 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 the yes, sort of most senior decision-making group, as far as the judiciary is concerned, is the mm -hmm. Magistrates' Liaison Group, yeah. which is a senior presiding judge, the Chief Magistrates, the Chairman of the MA, and the Chairman of MLE. And, and that's the group that, that makes the final decision. Well, in, technically, the Lord Chief mm -hmm. does, but on the recommendation of the Magistrates' Liaison Group. Um, and, and we get on very well. We, we're, all, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, yeah, which sure. is an efficient but fair justice system with emphasis on the fair. So we're all trying to do the same thing. Uh, we're not sort of fighting amongst each other in any way. Has it helped the lines of communications that we were talking about that were a bit of a problem or made no difference? I think it has helped because the, the four of us know each other very well and we see each other an awful lot. And, and so the <coughs> Magistrates Liaison Executive, the MA, the SPJ and the Chief Magistrate meet very frequently. And when there are things that need discussing, for example, the age at which magistrates should retire, uh, we're going to sort of have a, a formal discussion about that um, in MLE and come up with a, with a decision which we will all agree to. What, Mr. The, Webster, the role that MLE has in particular is to support bench chairmen. They are yes. the locally elected yep. leaders of the magistracy. Yep. And our role is to support them right. in giving them timely information, relevant information, so they can communicate that to their benches. And so um, if we can support bench chairmen to be more effective in that role, then uh, hopefully the, 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 the greater church of the magistracy will be better informed. I mean, communications with you know, up to 15,000 part-time really? people is a challenge in any event. Quite, yeah. um, and there will be some who will be very interested, others will take a more casual interest, and it's trying to get that balance right. No, I understand. Yeah. Mr. King? Um, I'm not sure I'm best placed to comment okay. because I was very heavily involved in signing the okay. new structure. So, 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 so you, you, you would prefer not to. So that, that's fair enough. The, the, the other thing that, um, that was picked up in our report, which has some impact on morale, um, what, what was getting the balance right be, between lay magistrates and the role of the district judges, in the sense that sometimes that the cases were cherry-picked and that therefore there was a bit of frustration about the sort of court work that the lay justices got to do as opposed to uh, the, the, the DJs. Um, has that balance changed? What's the relationship? I think that's like very now? much a problem of the past. Um, we're, we're working together very well. The Chief Magistrate and I have had discussions about that. Um, basically, um, the district judges and magistrates have the same powers, but there are cases that are far more appropriate for yeah. district judges. And district judges do do all the work the magistrates do as well. So occasionally things go wrong, and there's a high-profile case which is managed by the district judge, um, but there's almost always a reason why that happens. Um, so I think that is a, very much a thing of the past, and that in itself has increased morale, sure. because magistrates now enjoy working with district judges. Yep. District judges sometimes sit with magistrates, so. and, and everybody's encouraging a good relationship. It is a symbiotic relationship. We're both there. We're both needed. And uh, we're working together a lot more, a lot better than was the case some years ago. I think more use of mixed benches was something that both your association and I think our report had advocated. That's more. right. I would certainly agree that the relationship in general between district judges and magistracy is very strong. And we have, a, as you've heard, an excellent relationship with the chief magistrate. Yeah. And on benches, um, district judges are often to be found helping both formally and informally train magistrates. There are, of course, some cases that are particularly complex or very sensitive, which it's right that they are reserved to a district judge for case management and trial, but it's certainly not automatic that all sensitive or um, highly uh, public, or cases in which the public have a lot of interest, automatically go to district judges, and we do see benches doing those um, fairly routinely, particularly here in London, of course, where there are a high proportion of those types of cases. So I think that's a good news story. There is clear criteria for it, and I think the lay bench totally appreciates that, and the, the old sort of uh, arguments and divisions of the past are no longer that good. Well, that's un unanimity on progress. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's good. Ms. Davy. Good morning. Good morning. Hi there. You've sort of touched uh, on a couple of my points already, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, see where we go with these. <laughs> yeah. um, you've already mentioned uh, 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 there being around 15,000 part-time magistrates, and I'm just wondering, do you think this is enough for the work that's at hand? 
<coughs> no, uh, we, we need to recruit more magistrates. Um, there aren't sufficient magistrates. Magistrates are sitting now on benches of two quite frequently, including for trials, which is not as it should be and obviously has potential problems. So we need to increase the number of magistrates. The number might be uh, correct throughout the whole country, mm. but in an individual bench there's often uh, 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 too few magistrates, mm. and that is generally recognised. Of course, it doesn't help morale. Of course. Now, there's two ways of increasing the numbers. First of all, and by far the best way, is to increase recruitment. And we particularly want to increase recruitment. We want to improve diversity within the magistracy. At the moment, there's too many older magistrates. Um, the, the, the gender balance is about right. It's about 46% right. men, 54% women. So that's fine. Um, the ethnicity is a lot better. BAME is a lot better than it used to be. I think the latest figure is about 11%, which isn't that far off the national average. The big problem is age. Um, so what we want to do is encourage employers to let younger people off work to be Brilliant. a magistrate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We really are working on that. And if we can come back to that in a minute. But the other thing we could do, of course, is change the age of retirement. At the moment you have to retire at 70. Sure. Uh, the Magistrate Association passed a motion last month saying that that should be looked at again. Um, and we are looking at that in the magistrate's liaison group next month. Um, we could increase the age across the board to say 72 or alternatively probably a better plan is to do it according to need. So for instance in the family court mm -hmm. there's a real problem with shortage of magistrates and if magistrates could be allowed to continue for a year or two if necessary then that might be the answer. The problem is particularly with presiding justices who have a lot of experience but are coming up to 70. Mm -hmm. But the ideal way to increase numbers is to increase younger people coming into sure. the magistracy and we need to encourage employers to, to ensure that they let people off work to, to become magistrates. And there are obviously benefits to employers through having uh, employees who are magistrates mm -hmm. such as the ability to make judgment, the ability to listen to different arguments, to weigh evidence, to make difficult decisions and communication skills. So there are a lot of advantages to an employer from having an employee who is a magistrate, but we really need to emphasise that yes. to encourage more, more young people to become magistrates. Okay, that's that's very good. Um, <clears throat> that's that's very good. Um, in terms of um, the Ministry of Justice, it intends to reduce uh, the number by half of the advisory committees um, to in to um, introduce a national recruitment process. Do you think that's a positive development? I think it is. Um, the, the number of advisory committees was a bit high. It's going to be reduced, as you say. The important thing about that is it's going to be a national stra strategy. So each advisory committee is going to be working on the same basis as every other one. And the advisory committees are going to be divided into two, those for recruitment and those for discipline. Not ma many magistrates get into trouble, but a few do. And hopefully the, there will be a certain amount of experience within each region mm. uh, with those... Um, I can't remember the word, it's not discipline, but uh, can't, 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 yeah, that's right. So um, I, I think it is going to be positive, yeah. I think since the um, committee reported in 2016, uh, HMCTS and Judicial Office, with strong support from the magistracy, have worked very hard on looking at um, improving recruitment. Um, and we had a, a system where many of those advisory committees were operating slightly different systems, which um, it was felt was to be wrong. Anyone applying to the magistracy should be confident they're applying to a consistent process and are judged by consistent standards. So that's um, behind some of the drive to reduce the number of advisory committees so right. that um, there's better oversight, better coordination. Right. Um, and I think that there's a tremendous amount of work that's done that and it's going to be very positive in terms of recruitment and in terms of streamlining the process, um, speeding up the process, the committee um, expressed concern on, on the last report um, about the length of time it takes to recruit mm. and obviously that causes difficulties with some applicants who may well give up before they get to the end of that process. So there, there are really positive steps have been taken um, to improve that recruitment process which I think we should welcome. Um, in addition to um, the age question that um, my colleague has mentioned, um, the other area of diversity which I think has become 
a little overlooked recently, and particularly when we have had very low levels of recruitment, <coughs> and that's social diversity. Mm. Um, and I, I think we need to ensure that we are recruiting from a broader range of people as possible. Mm -hmm. There is still a tendency for the public to think of magistrates as being um, perhaps professional people sure. who are retired, and that's a very outdated um, view of magistrates. And we, we really need to support and encourage those people in um, what perhaps might have been called white or blue collar jobs, sure. in, in my experience, who make excellent magistrates. Um, the issue around employers releasing them is a very mm. valid one um, for all mm. Um, mm. backgrounds, mm. really. But I, I'd be particularly keen to see the social, so the social diversity of the magistracy yeah. improve. Is, is there a strategy around this to do this? Or? There is. Um, we're in the fairly early stages of some work to try and address that. Um, so HMCTS and Judicial Office are um, going out to talk to um, some non-standard groups, um, for example, a housing association, mm -hmm. um, not just in terms of their employees, but people who are in housing association accommodation, and um, raising awareness of the magistracy within um, the non-traditional groups so that people can identify themselves as, as having that potential. Mm -hmm. I think we have suffered quite badly from the lack of any real um, awareness raising amongst the public mm. and after all that's our pool of candidates that we're going to be drawn from. Sure. So if the general population don't see themselves as identifying as potential magistrates then however good our recruitment process mm. is we're, we're going to be um, dealing with a very limited pool of candidates so that engage, that wider engagement is absolutely vital to change that demographic. Thank we you. are also piloting a, a new or trying a new deployment protocol. In other words, we're going to be looking at the needs, numbers needs of the magistracy for a longer period. So rather than doing it on an annual basis, we're mostly on a two month, a two yearly mm -hmm. basis, um, and and trying to plan more effectively for the numbers of magistrates that we're going to 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 need. One of the suggestions that has been put forward in the past, particularly about trying to get over the issue about. Uh, employers releasing people. Um, one suggestion that has come forward is uh, to make it a legal requirement for employers to release staff for the, a public service like the magistracy, yes. uh, particularly as they do for, say, jurors. Mm -hmm. But uh, whether that would find favour in certain it's quarters. Yeah. But it's given that uh, everyone <coughs> says the magistracy you know, completes 95% of criminal cases, mm. they're an essential part of the judicial yes. system. Yes. If they're that essential, then why not support that essential need with yes. the status of some legislation behind it? Well, thank you for that. For that. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Ms. Rimmer. Can you explain to us why it's important for magistrates to continue with training after the initial induction stage, please? Magistrates' training throughout their careers is absolutely essential. We, we work in a very dynamic environment in which all sorts of aspects of our work change constantly. So we have new legislation, changes to sentencing guidelines and so on. Um, so I would say that um, a commitment to continuing training is required of all magistrates, um, not just the formal training that judicial office offer, but also um, keeping up to date with um, changes in the society in which we work. We've had a recent update to the Equal Treatment Bench Book, for example, which isn't something that magistrates will um, be formally trained on, but it's um, presented in a very accessible way um, that people can self-learn from it, for example. Um, and, I, and I think that is widely seen as a very positive move. My, my view would be that magistrates' training certainly needs to be reprioritised at a higher level than it currently sits. Um, the annual report on training indicates that the, that the minimum training was delivered across the country. Uh, but I'd have sort of two observations on that that perhaps are relevant. Certainly that the, the considerable changes, continual changes really in law practice and procedure and the fact that actually magistrates are learning to do their work on a minimum number of sittings of 26 which in any other kind of working environment you'd have far more practice at it than, than 26 half days a year uh, and, so, and also got to recognise that magistrates are doing the same job as district judges and, and with district judges they're doing it the job daily 
and, and, and magistrates are doing it 26 half days a year as a minimum. So training, I think, should be reprioritised. Certainly, there should be an increase in the minimum training requirement to tie in now with the new appraisal scheme, where a presiding justice is going to be appraised every two years. So you should really extend the minimum of six hours every training, uh, six hours every year. Um, no, every three years, isn't it? Yes, six years every three years to now six hours every two years uh, to bring it in line with the uh, appraisal cycle. But also, much of the training is currently delivered in courthouse accommodation. Now, as that estate reduces, uh, many of the buildings are not fit to deliver training. And the training budget, I think, really needs to be looked at by HMCCTS in terms of the amount of training that's delivered. Meeting the minimum requirement, I don't think, is sufficient. And magistrates like to be competent. And in being competent, it gives them confidence. And confidence equals morale. And I think the public has a right to expect magistrates to be up to date as well. You know, at the end of the day, magistrates can put people in prison for six months or two years for children, and they can take people's children away from them. So that's a, quite a powerful thing to do. And I think the public has a right to ensure that magistrates are up to date. Magistrates want to keep up to date as well. Can I just comment on what Duncan's just said? The 26 is the minimum number of sittings. Uh, an awful lot of magistrates do an awful lot more than 26 sittings per year, but that is the minimum number. Okay. And we have a new um, court appraisal system, and it will be very yes, interesting to see yeah. whether that's effective in terms of identifying those magistrates who aren't um, keeping up to date and, and competent. Is there sufficient funding for magistrates to get the ongoing training they need? In our last report, we actually asked for more funding, but training was seen as adequate. Do you think there's sufficient funding to provide the training? The um, amount spent per head has decreased. Massively. Increased? Decreased. Increased. Well, it went from 72 to 30. Um, I think it's now around £26 pounds per head per year. Um, right, thank you for that. Which is a concern. I, I will need to check that because I haven't got the exact figures in front of me at the moment, but if it's any different from that, I will let the committee know. Thank you for that. Would either of you like to comment or is that sufficient for you? I think okay. that supports the comment I made earlier. Right. That I think training needs to be reprioritised both financially and in the, in the line of how we deliver training and what we deliver training on. Yeah. The other thing, if I can just very briefly mention about training, there is essential training, which, as I said, is essential, and that's got to be delivered. But there's also an awful lot of training which isn't actually essential but still very, very relevant to magistrates. And the Magistrates Association in particular could contribute to that. But funding, uh, understandably, if magistrates are finishing a day at work and then go to evening training, it's not unrealistic for them to expect at least coffee and biscuits yeah. and their travelling yeah. expenses. Yes. That, that is not unreasonable, I don't think. Yeah, thank you. Um, the previous committee's report set out a complex structure of training responsibilities for the magistrate, which was supervised by the Judicial College. <coughs> Are the new training approval, approvals, authorisation of prayers and committees working more effectively in overseeing magistrates' training than the multiple committee under the previous structure? Do you think they're working more effectively? It's early days yet. It's only been in existence since April. Um, one problem they have had is recruiting people to, to be on the J tax and F tax. We, we can't go on with all those authorisations, we just call them J tax and F tax. And they have had difficulty recruiting people because the workload is quite excessive. Um, certainly, people, the forms to fill in are a lot more sensible than they were, but we haven't really had time yet to analyse the efficacy of the, of the changes. I think there is a feeling that uh, from bench chairman that certainly the uh, JTAX, as we call them, the NEFTAX, are in some way uh, disconnected from the, the running of the benches. Um, and that may be an issue that, of course, the, the JTAX and FTAX sort of run in, in larger areas than perhaps the benches do. I think that can be overcome. I think there is a concern, though, about how... Uh, if appraisals are, you know, as well as looking to uh, develop individuals, appraisals should also, of course, develop the organisation, i.e. the yes, performance of the, of, the, of, the, of the justice system. Yeah. And where you quite get that connect with the new structure, I think has yet to be teased out properly. 
Um, and I got some ideas about that, but it's still embryonic and we still need to see about really how these JTACs and FTACs perform. And they've got a huge job to do potentially as well because we're short of presiding justices across the country and also uh, they've got a lot of new magistrates to recruit sure. and then train and yeah. appraise and get sitting in court. So they've got a lot on their plate at the moment. It, ha have you had sufficient time to spot any disadvantages in the new system compared to the old one? Have you had an, any no enough time to comment on that? I think the relationship with the bench chairman is different and um, <clears throat> that needs more work to be done. The, the JTAX and FTAX operate on a larger geographical basis than the yes. benches in most areas. And so, uh, whereas the, in the old system the training committees were bench-based. So that relationship, I think, is one that still um, is in its formative stages, and we need to see how to improve that um, dialogue between them. So have you spotted any disadvantages you'd like to comment yet? No? Not Only yet. recruitment to the committees has been a real problem, uh, and the workload is, is quite excessive. But other than that, I, I don't think so. Thank you for that. Thanks very much, Ms Prentice. I'd like to talk about court closures. Um, I should start by saying that I represent um, both Vista Mags, which closed several years ago, and Banbury Mags, which is earmarked to close in February. So this is um, something I've always taken a very close interest in. Can you tell us, um, well, you, you, you did touch earlier on recruitment and court closures being connected. Um, I know that we're likely to lose five magistrates locally um, with Banbury closing. Is that something that's repeated across the country? It's fair to say that where courts have closed for some individual magistrates, um, the journey to the, the receiving court, if I can put it that way, may be just too far for them. So I, I, I don't have figures for it, but certainly anecdotally I'm aware that most courts that have closed have lost some magistrates on the back of that. And closure. are you worried about diversity? Uh, uh, my concern is that there's a large area of, of um, rural Middle England, if you like, Northamptonshire, Warwickshire, um, North Oxfordshire, where we won't any longer be recruiting. Yes, I think, um, again, there, there are no official statistics to back this up, but um, certainly my experience, and I um, sit in Brighton, which covers... Um, Sussex Central, which actually includes um, Brighton and Hove, but also half of East Sussex, which is a very rural, dispersed community. Um, we had a court in Lewis until 2011. Um, I have noticed that a lot of, a very high proportion of recruits in recent years come from the Brighton area, mm. and very few, um, in fact, I can't think of any recently, from areas such as Wadhurst, which mm. is right in the extremes of our area, where it would take an hour and a half to get to Brighton. So common sense tells us that um, if courts are reduced and um, become more centrally located in large urban areas, then it is likely that um, the role of the magistrate will be less attractive to those mm -hmm. that live um, a long distance from the court. Uh, this is, these are unpaid roles. Already we have magistrates in some areas uh, who travel for two hours to get to their local court. Yeah. So we we heard evidence, um, the previous committee heard in, indeed, some very colleague, powerful evidence from Wales. Indeed, I, I was yeah. here um, yeah. with my colleague from <laughs> Wales and I, and I recall and, and I um, have frequent contact with yes. colleagues in Wales who, but it's not just Wales, no. so there are other areas of the country where similar problems exist. Do, do the magistrates, sorry, sorry. a big difference between rural and urban yes. uh, because the cities are less of a problem in yes. that respect. But all the, the shire counties, the distances are, are, are very big. And, of course, they're equally big for the defendants and the witnesses and the, and the, and the victims the as well. And the victims. Yes, that's um, right. Yes, uh, before we move on to users, as it were, um, did magistrates feel that they were adequately consulted or that their responses to the consultation process were heard? I think that certainly they had the opportunity to consult as uh, a member of the public would. Uh, they were given the consultation documents. They could write in responses. I think tactically now the magistracy would rather write in individual responses because we're sort of told that numbers do count. So mm -hmm. it's no point one bench chairman writing in for 200 magistrates because it's just considered to be one response. consultation response. 
Um, I mean, the extent to which they are listened to. Well, with the last round of court closures, all bar one were closed. Dis- yes, I mean, despite I mean, our, our responses. I mean, North Yorkshire yes. and North Allerton, North Allerton I know, of which yes. there was huge public. Uh, yes. concern about the closure of that courthouse. The, nearly every magistrate on the bench wrote, county councils wrote, district councils yes. wrote, parish councils wrote, members of the public wrote. There were over e- 800... Even MPs got involved. Yes, <laughs> indeed, yes, there were over 800 responses, one of the largest yeah. responses out of that round of closures, yet North Allerton is closing. I think it's very important that um, we get the response to the other consultation that took place at the same time as the North Allerton yes. and Banbury. So there were eight courts that were yeah. um, proposed for closure. We've had the response to that consultation or those consultations, but we've yet to have the response to the Fit for the Future consultation, yes. which HMCTS launched on the same day. And that's really about how future court closures will be decided. Yes. And so I think magistrates and other judiciary, as, the, as well mm. as the public, will be very much looking forward to seeing that response um, and seeing on what basis decisions may be taken in the future. Can we... Um try and move on. I know it's difficult for all of us. I think we're coming from the same place on this. But uh, you reminded us earlier that what we're talking about is access to justice for often the most vulnerable people in society. So not just the defendant, but the victim, the witnesses. You know, of course, we're talking about magistrates and how difficult it is for them to travel to court. But I think all of us agree that we're really worried about the other people who don't necessarily have cars and ability to travel. Are there things we can do to make to consider mobile magistrates' courts, for example? I, I should say that I took two of my magistrates to see the minister yesterday to ask if we could pilot such a scheme in Banbury for the most vulnerable court users, so specifically youth courts and family courts, as, as well as a bit of other. Um, do, are you happy to, for that sort of thing to be explored? There have been... Um various attempts to um, and, and various terms for alternative provision pop-up courts so we've, we have some examples and Tunbridge Wells mm, very close to me is one where actually it's working quite well but that's not a course for crime um, and then we have other areas such as Anglesey um, where it's been very difficult mm. for that court to work and I think there are differences between certainly crime and family um, family I think there should be potential. There are generally fewer security concerns, for example. Uh, can um, I push you on that, though? Because with the youth um, system, very few people, truthfully, get sent, sentenced to custody at indeed. the end of a hearing. And, um, so really, I think, is that something you would push back on? Well, I, no, I, <laughs> I would say that youths are a particularly um, important area that we need to look at and I don't think we have devoted enough time to looking at um, use within the criminal justice yeah. system. Um, I'm very concerned about the time and distances that some youths have to yes. travel to get to court, um, both those um, on bail or, or yes. um, on postal requisition but also very importantly those that have been remanded in custody who are often having to travel extremely long distances in prison vans which are completely unsuitable yeah. for them. And um, in my view, it makes perfect sense to try and take the court to them rather yes. than them to the court. There was talk some years ago of a justice bus. Yes. And it was almost a joke. But in fact, I, I think there's a very good yes, argument for it. I don't see why not. So as Joe's just said, that the, the court goes to the individual. Yes rather the individual to the court. It can't be beyond the wit of man. And at the end of the day, that's what judges were doing centuries ago when they were going oh, on circuit. Exactly. And oh, the high court the, in the coronial system as well. That's right. So would you support my pilot mm. even sometimes for crime yes. if we can work um, the security aspect? Yes. You certainly look to, to try and yes. something like that. Uh, is it something you'd be interested in looking at, Mr Webster? Uh, yes, I'd say cautiously yes. because... Um, they have been tried and it is limiting in the amount of work and some of that work is now going to what we call the single justice procedure mm. which are being you know, held in rooms uh, without the defendant or witnesses and people being called. I think we've also got to look to the reform programme yes. and the advent of better technology. I know for example I don't mean to keep harping back to North Yorkshire but the North Allerton Courthouse, one of the one of the uh, uh, conditions of that closure 
was that some video link facility is available yes. so that vulnerable witnesses... And, and that could be placed in CABs, for example, in towns be, like Northampton yes, and Yes, and Bangary. then it's beamed to a, yes. a more central courthouse. So witnesses and vulnerable people and victims yes. do not have to travel necessarily to the courthouse to give yes. their evidence. It could be done somewhere more, and, more and one of my big concerns is that um, uh, road traffic <laughs> hearings are now primarily to do with disqualification, if we're honest. And um, I'm concerned that people effectively are being set up to fail they, if they can't walk home afterwards or, or have accessible public transport home afterwards. So would you be concerned about that sort of case being heard locally? A lot of, this, um, a lot of uh, disqualifications are dealt with now through the single justice yes, procedure and uh, people can be disqualified in their absence. I have concerns about that in terms of setting people yeah. up to fail because if they don't know they've been disqualified, mm. uh, I mean, the onus is on them really mm. to contact the court uh, afterwards to check the, uh, the outcome of their case, but we know that people don't do that. And then they're in effect caught for driving whilst disqualified, which is an incredibly serious offence, mm. which you can go to prison. Um, and there they are not knowing. And of course, that means they're then uninsured as well. So it does have consequences. Um, but yes, most people will come to court if for no other reason to show cause why they shouldn't be disqualified. Yes, exactly. And of course, if they've then got to make arrangements, if, if their application fails, they then, of course, have to make their own arrangements to get home. Yes, you're right. They'll be on notice, wouldn't they, in a sense? They would, yeah. So they come prepared, I hope, for that Thank eventuality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. Very helpful. Mr Hans. Um, problem solving thoughts. Um, Prime Minister said she wants to see them. Uh, Caroline Garan, who's the then minister in June 16, supported a working group recommendation. This committee's supported the potential. Anything happened? Um, no. Why? Uh, the problem-solving initiative that gained momentum under uh, Mr Gove uh, has not been resurrected. Should and it be? Yes, I think it should, definitely. Yeah. And magistrates have taken some of this problem-solving uh, work into their own hands, actually. And for example, in Northamptonshire, there's um, a model being uh, used currently where the magistrates get involved with the youths via the um, yacht teams and they talk to the young people about their what? referral orders. So it's happening informally where magistrates what, want what? to be involved, but in terms of any national pilots, it hasn't, it hasn't seen the light of day. Have no. you made any further representations to government about it happening since June 16? Uh, the MLE hasn't, no. If magistrates, it, it's on the statute books, so it hasn't actually been enacted, but if magistrates could monitor um, people post-sentence that would be incredibly beneficial because it would give us more confidence in community sentences. It would give the person who'd been sentenced the idea that the magistrates were still keeping an eye on them. Uh, and it would be to everybody's benefit. It's on the statute books, but it hasn't been enacted. Uh, as Duncan says, th there is an initiative in um, Northamptonshire which is specifically with youth and which is actually being presented at the Youth Justice Conference today. And um, that, that shows a lot of potential because magistrates will be seeing young people post-sentence at, uh, say, every six weeks or whatever, and, and just sort of ensuring that they are making progress. And that would give us more confidence and would definitely, in my opinion, help the, the um, defendants as well. Okay, you, you've mentioned community sentencing. Uh, where are we with confidence from magistrates in the exercise of community penalties? The fact that we now can, very recently, we've been allowed to communicate directly with the uh, community rehabilitation companies. There was a time when we were very heavily discouraged from having direct contact. And that meant that we were sentencing, and we weren't entirely sure what we were sentencing to. So that didn't give us great confidence in the community sentences. That has now been rectified. Uh, the senior presiding judge now uh, is encouraging um, magistrates to, con to contact directly the community rehabilitation companies. And However, that I will give us more confidence. Can, can I phrase the question in another way then? The, the, the government have put great store on reducing the number of people going to prison for under 12 months and certainly for under 6 months. To do that they need to have an increase in the number of community based penalties issued by magistrates or other courts. And I suppose my question is, is that likely to happen given 
the level of confidence or arrangements you I have think, currently. Um, the committee heard from the Lord Chief Justice last week on this matter as well, and I support his comments. Um, transforming rehabilitation has been problematic in many ways, and there has been, I think, a drop off in confidence in community sentences. Um, the one step removal of the community rehabilitation companies from magistrates has not helped. Um, and certainly there's been a lot of concern around um, whether breaches are being brought um, appropriately and in a timely manner. Uh, and, and there are, we've heard many anecdotal um, concerns from magistrates about very, very high levels of breaches before people are being brought back. Um, it's absolutely essential that we have confidence in those community sentences so that they can be used as a really viable alternative to custody. So what needs to change? If um, we, we're in a process at the moment. The government has uh, consulted on transforming rehabilitation. It was a very broad consultation. I have, don't believe it's reported yet. Um, we need to look at the way the um, contracts are let for those companies, the supervision of them, the reporting back to benches. Uh, and to, to reinvigorate, to make sure that magistrates are confident when they impose a, a community sentence, that it is a robust sentence that meets the objectives that they identified um, for that particular sentence, and that we get an adequate feedback um, from the CRCs and from the National Probation Service on how an individual is performing on that um, order, so that we can use them appropriately. Okay. Um, final question, Chairman. Do, do you have any views on... Um giving magistrates greater powers to increase the length of sentence to 12 months. We're in favour of that. Again, it's on the statute books, but hasn't actually been enacted. Um, if, if magistrates had 12-month sentencing powers, that would obviously relieve the pressure on the Crown Courts to a very large extent, because the Crown Courts at the moment are dealing with a lot of cases that really should be in the magistrates' courts, but for whatever reason they're being dealt with in the Crown Courts. Um, I think the government is, in, is worried that the number of people in custody would increase. I don't think there's any evidence for that at all. And certainly when magistrates' powers were increased from six months to two years in the youth court, the, the number of young people in custody decreased very dramatically from about 3,500 to about 900. So, yeah, have you made representations recently to the government to enact this power? The problem is it's been on the book since 2003. Eventually, you sort of wonder if it's ever going to happen. We, we would very much encourage it to happen, but that's up to the government, not up to us. I think on the last occasion, Mr. Farah here said to you that he would certainly um, indicate that he would look at pilot areas. I think um, he's had two jobs on his own. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, uh, <laughs> but I'm certainly not aware of any pilot areas. And also, they did say that the MOJ would undertake some modelling of the potential impact on the prison population, but uh, I'm not aware of any modelling that has taken place either. I think also what was said last time is that the new allocation guidelines had not, in fact, bedded in. Um, well, they've well and truly been bedded in now, and I think the national statistics indicate something along the lines of nearly 80% of either way cases are retained in the magistrates' court. So certainly 20% of them find their way to the Crown Court. And um, what I don't know is the statistics of that 20%, how many of them would receive a sentence that could be imposed by magistrates if they had the 12 months for a single offence. So in summary, and all of that, because time's pressing, basically uh, we should ask the government about problem-solving introduction, we should ask the government about introducing community sense of strengthening and we should ask the government when the 12 months is going to be enacted. I think if I could just say that I think justice has taken a fairly low profile in terms of priorities at the moment which is very disappointing for us. <coughs> we know there are other things on um, the government's mind but justice is extremely important. And, and the government has said also that of course it would look at what other opportunities there would be available to expand the role of the magistracy. And uh, as far as I'm aware, that has really hit the buffers as well. And on the last occasion, certainly uh, adjudications on prison discipline was, was, was mentioned. Um, that's something that I think the magistracy is still interested in. As obviously also continue to look at, the, at a more extensive role of the magistracy within the civil jurisdiction. Um, but again, that perhaps a longer term strategy, but certainly something that I know magistrates could be interested in. That's very helpful. Ms. Rimmer, do you come in on that last point, uh, the strategy? Um, 
After taking extensive evidence, um, the previous committee concluded that the Magistry was facing a range of unresolved issues relating to its role and its workload. Um, the Government has not taken any steps to develop a national strategy for the Magistry, which was put forward by us. We understand that there is now a judicially led working group developing a national strategy for the Magistry, but that the Ministry of Justice is not involved in it. Could you tell us what the strategy is hoping to achieve and whether you think the lack of government involvement will hold back its ambitions? I was actually involved in starting that strategy and now Duncan has mm -hmm. um, taken over chair of that. Um, it came really from um, a realisation that there wasn't um, a great deal of coordination between uh, all the different bodies that were doing work on uh, magistrates. Uh, and so initially, certainly, it was to try and bring together under one umbrella um, the work that was being done on recruitment, advisory committees, and so on and so forth, so that there was an oversight process and we could identify the gaps and then work with um, the agencies, whoever they may be, but in particular MOJ, um, <coughs> in resolving some of those. So I was involved in setting up that strategy group until I handed over the leadership role to Duncan at the beginning of October, um, so perhaps yeah. in terms of future look, Duncan may be the best place to... So respond. the Magistrate's Leadership Executive is leading on the development of this strategy now, and uh, we are working with the Magistrates Association and the Chief Magistrate's Office in the development of it, and in October this year we issued our first discussion paper to the Magistracy as a whole, and we're now seeking feedback and views on that. The strategy will set <coughs> out basically a three-year plan uh, it's a plan of action to develop the magistracy, keep it relevant, improve it, and that plan will be driven by the magistracy. And we will involve the MOJ on any matters that we wish to progress with them that require their involvement. Um, so we will work alongside. There will be some things that we can probably do ourselves, but other things that, yes, we will need MOJ involvement. And we hope that they will uh, contribute and contribute positively to that. Sure is it will. holding back and your, any ambitions of the lack of, of government involvement? In your, is it holding you back? Would you be much more ambitious? Could we get more? I think the one area that is holding us back is the availability of resources. Of, the, of resources. Right. Uh, not only in terms of just more funding for more initiatives, but the, right. but the MOJ are losing, and the HMCTS uh, are, are losing a lot of staff, both through the reform programme, which is one area, but also through the setting up of uh, uh, justice centres, or service centres, I think they're called, service centres. Service centres. Uh, and so a lot of staff are leaving, and the initiatives that we want to take forward uh, and have the support and the resources of HMCTS staff um, things have to wait in a queue until they have staff available to support us in delivering some of these So initiatives. these are not posts that's been reduced, this is people just leaving? Uh, both. Both. Uh, under both. reform, um, the HMS CCF staff will reduce from 16,000 to 10,000. Yes. Um, and they will be working in a different way. So the Courts and Tribunal Service Centres will be centres of administration. So there's, that process has started of people moving into... Uh, centralised administration hubs and just as with magistrates change is very difficult for the staff so um, there have been quite a high number of, of people leaving for various reasons some of them um, have been replaced on a temporary basis others um, have not it's, it's just like the lack of resources are the resources going to be available then? Or if the posts have gone and that work has gone you know it's not going to be available but if the if it's people that's left that there is post there not been deleted you can get that in the future hopefully is okay. that the case that's I think is, is it holding back your ambition would you be much more ambitious i don't think there's a lack of willingness for hmcts to to support us in what we want right. to achieve okay um, and certainly work with us but they have, their priorities may not be our priorities. Okay. I think there are some areas where I think the committee identified in the last occasion, um, for example, uh, we've been pushing uh, for a review of magistrates' expenses. Um, that has yet to take place. Um, expenses rates are still as they were in May 2010. 
which again is a, a perhaps a limiting factor when we're looking at recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, magistrates shouldn't be subsidising HMCTS, I would suggest. Okay. Would you like to comment on it? Uh, well, I just agree with, with what's been said, actually. It, it, it does come down to resources. It comes mm -hmm. down to a balance between efficiency and justice. And HMCTS is going for efficiency, which is absolutely fine. That's its job. Um, but the judiciary obviously wants a fair balance. And it, it's, a, it, and it's <coughs> a question of getting that balance right. We're all trying to achieve an efficient and fair system of justice. But the trouble is the resources are decreasing. And we can see the efficiency of digitalisation, but a lot of the people who come in front of us are not particularly um, equipped to sort of deal with that. So there are problems with the, with the reforms, and it comes down very largely to resources and to actual people as well. You think, you think you've got the maximum efficiency you can with justice? I you think know, you think it's going right. Yeah, I mean, there's always re uh, areas that can be improved, and we're dealing yes. with human beings, and things can go wrong in court on a specific day. But I think we, we work reasonably efficiently, yes. There are certainly some aspects of reform which I think are long overdue. Mm -hmm. I mean, you heard from the Lord Chief Justice about the um, digital case system in the Crown Court and the Magistrates' Courts, where we're dealing with high volume, low complexity, was really desperately in need of digital file, a single file that travels the whole way through the system to avoid those issues of duplication of effort and rekeying and all the errors and so on. So certainly efficient, further efficiencies that can be made and hopefully reform will and it's right enable to us to do them. Absolutely. I mean, we're, yes. we're probably 20 or 30 years behind in terms of um, modernisation of the court system. Um, so there are some to be made. Obviously it's, it's right that we do that in a um, appropriate way. Also, I want to make the point that I believe, from my experience, the magistracy is fully behind reform. Yes. You know, we know that we need to reform, we know we need to improve, and we need the money to, to do to that. Do it. And therefore, there are consequences you for things like the court of state mm -hmm. and resources. Um, but you know, we have to be realistic and we have to be optimistic. Right. We're Thank behind you for reform, that. but the most vulnerable mustn't suffer. Mm. No. Uh, because of the reform okay, process. Okay. Well, that's thank you for that. That's a very clear message at the end. Well, thank you very much, oh, ladies and gentlemen, for your evidence. And can I just thank you personally for the work you do as magistrates, and also uh, to all your members, to, 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 to all magistrates, who we actually, yeah. I know, do a very great deal on a voluntary basis, for which the system couldn't function otherwise. So I hope you'll take that on we behalf will. of everyone, we'll uh, as back. well as yourselves. So thank, thank you, you very thank much for your evidence. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. And we'll move on to our next panel.